Good morning, church. Let's prepare our Bible this morning as we are going to learn together the Word of God again. Um, I'm so happy to see you all alive and well. I hope you are warm. Yesterday was, you know, a reminder to us that we're still in New England. <laughs> and, and it's just amazing. Um, you know, I know I've, I've been, uh, this is close to the 25th years of me living here. But, you know, every time it happened, it still amazes me, all right? And I thought it was going to end in the morning, like the, the previous forecast says, the, the, the storm will stop on Sunday morning at 6, but thank God it stopped at 9, so at 10, I begin to plow the road, and man, it's hard work. <laughs> so if I look tired today, um, you know, have mercy on me, all right? So let's open our Bible together. Oh, man, I don't know how many times I've read this passage, but every time I read this, you know, I, I get something new. I want to encourage you to, you know, put down a mark on 1 Corinthians 13 and, you know, continue to meditate on it and read. So we're going to close down our service this, uh, not, well, not our service. We're gonna, <laughs> oh, man, you know, the cable, the cable must cross there inside. So I, I want to close down this series, you know, this week. But I want to encourage you to continue to study about 1 Corinthians 13, verse 1 to 13. All right, let's read it together. If I speak in the tongue of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom the, all the mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. So first I am nothing, and then the second is I gain nothing. First for love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it does not dishonor other. It is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails, but where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be still. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away, for we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. Completeness means Jesus. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put, away, I put the ways of childhood behind me. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. But, but then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. Verse 13, and now these three remains, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of this is love. Amen. Amen. We've, we've, we've learned this, this uh, I think this is the fourth week now, and this is what in the Christian theology is known as the three virtues. The three virtues. These three remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest is love. Now, last week we also learned that this virtues will remain, or it means it will become the standard. It will be the standard of which or by which we shall be graded. You know that will guide our our journey and our conduct. And what is more, we learn in Hebrew chapter ten is that we are to stir it up as the day is drawing near. We're living in the day of days. We are living in the end of end times. And there is such an emphasis and such an urge in Hebrew chapter 10, verse 25, that we are to stir it up. We are to stir it up uh, as the day is drawing near. So last week, we also learned about how this tree interacts as a structure together. And I hope that as you learn this, you know, it becomes, uh, it, it's, you should employ it, you should use it, you should uh, um, understand it. And if you understand how it works, um, I promise you it will be, 
it will be a tool that can help you enhance your journey and your spirituality. I uh, present to you a very simple chart uh, last week, you know, about faith, hope, and love. Love being the greatest, love being the first, love being the foundation. It is the foundation. It is the bedrock of which everything stands. And on the side, if you see those uh, two yellow stripes, it's just simply my way of trying to illustrate that all these two things, remember love, uh, 1 Corinthians 13, verse 7, uh, verse 4, love always believe and love always hope. So faith and hope rested on love. And everything else must operate within the conduit of love. Faith is dangerous without love. And we've seen the evidence of it throughout history, how dictators and, you know, people who are so ardent in their belief, who are so strongly convicted on their principle, rise up and ended up demolishing civilization, demolishing society, because they are so... Uh, they, are so, uh, uh, they are so firm on their belief, but yet they are channeling their belief, not on the foundation of love. We, as a follower of Christ, we are so different. Though God would command us to be so in believing that, that we are walking in faith, but faith is not a standalone concept that stands together. But in this passage, Paul gives a further clue to us that love, must be the conduit of everything, of what everything that hope and faith transmit. You know, so last week I gave you a picture of like an electric, high voltage electric cable. You know, it is, uh, um, faith is like an electric power. It's very useful. It gets things done. But if you are not able to channel it in such a way that is safe, you know, it's going to end up doing more destruction than good, all right? So the interaction was this. So we learned last week that when your faith is struggling, then, you know, according to that uh, structure, you got to go down one, one, one level and you got to inspect your hope. Because we remember that faith is a substance of things hoped for. So it means that faith takes cue from our hope. Whatever that you are hoping, faith takes action. You know, remember a, a, a toothpaste, if you will, whatever you squeeze, what's inside will go, is going to come out. So what's inside is your hope. Because I have hope that my life is not in vain, because my life has a purpose, God has redeemed me for a purpose, God has called me for a direction, therefore I am alive and I am out and about doing things. Because I so believe in the certainty of what we're doing here, I persevere in what I'm doing. I get up this morning, I get myself ready. The same thing goes with your everyday life. Your everyday life is, 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 is empowered by your faith. You go to school because you believe. That's your simple action of faith. But that action of faith is rested on the hope that what you do is going to do great things for you and for other people. You're actually fulfilling a greater cost than just living your life. So faith takes action for the hope, from your hope. So if your faith is struggling, you know, sometimes we try to uh, muster up things on a wrong approach. We, oh, I need, I need a bigger faith. I need a bigger faith. I mean, don't feel bad because even the apostle have the same mistake. You know, when Jesus gave them a charge that is bigger and stronger and more difficult, their first response to Jesus is, Lord, increase our faith. But Jesus says, you don't need a bigger faith. Even if you have a faith as small as a mustard seed, you can move mountains. But see, that's the understanding. Faith does not need to be big, but as long as it is planted on a good soil. And that good soil, my brothers and my sisters, is the hope that we found in Christ Jesus. So when your faith is struggling, look deep, deep within your hope. What, what's the construct of your hope? What's the inventory of your hope? You know, maybe your hope needs to be reaffirmed. Maybe your confidence on who God is needs to be rebuilt. Because you cannot pull yourself with your own bootstrap, just like the most American believe. You know, God help those who help themselves. Well, I believe in hard work. But you got to understand that it's just beyond you. You know, you got to believe in the sovereignty and in the source of God. And, you know, before you are so fast at, you know, applying self-help methods and trying to rescue yourself with your own strength and good deeds, I'm here to let you know that, you know, you can only try so far but I hate to burst your bubble, you know, we cannot help within just our own strength. 
Maybe your confidence in who God is need to be rebuilt. Maybe your assurance of His promises need to be refreshed. Listen to this. Romans chapter 10 verse 17 says this. You know, faith comes from hearing and that is hearing the good news about Christ. So we have let ourselves to believe all this time that faith comes by hearing and hearing of the word of God. So we thought that if we would just recite the word of God, then faith will come up. No, well, it actually is more specific than that. Read it again. It says, faith comes by hearing and hearing of the good news about Christ. So you need to be reminded about the good news about Christ. What is the good news about Christ? The fact that Christ has died on the cross and settled everything and he say, it is finished. It is finished. You need to be reminded, it is finished. All right? So, you know, the greatest thing about our faith, faith in God means believing in and trusting in the greatest hope. That's for us. I don't know about other beliefs. But for us as a Christian, faith in God means believing in and trusting in the greatest hope that God becomes man, live a perfect life without sin, died a sacrificial death for you and I, for our sin, and rose again to glory so that you could have, you and I can have eternal life by the transforming power of the Holy Spirit. When you remember that, when you keep reciting the truth, the reality about God, you need to be constantly reminded of the message, the goodness of Christ, the reality of God, because our life depends on the reality of God, not the reality that we are seeing. Because our reality keeps on changing, but the reality about God and the finality of what He does at the cross never change. So everything else may change, but not that. So rather than banking ourselves on shifting sands, building our structure of life on shifting sands, we might as well rest it on the rock that is greater than us. So faith in God means believing in and trusting in the greatest hope. So there it is. You know, when our faith is struggling, we need to inspect our hope. We need to, you know, be, we need to reassure again the promises. We need to rehearse again the promise. What did he say again about me? What did he say again about my Christian? Because the, 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 the truth is many times in our life when we start having a tough times, we start losing sight of what get us to start the journey in the first place. So that's why it's very important to write down the promise of God. If you are in the habit of journaling, whether digitally or you know, manually, that's a good thing. Because you can always go back and revisit it. You can always read it again. I do that right here on my iPad. I have my own personal devotion. I wrote things. What, whatever comes to my mind as I was in the devotion and things that many times God spoke to me in, in the times that I do not appoint. God can speak to you whenever and wherever. He, at least you have enough discipline to write it down because you can revisit again. So that is faith in God. It means believing in, trusting in the greatest hope. The greatest hope that, you know, there's a God, a God who loves you, God who became man and perfect, live a perfect life without sin, died a sacrificial death, for your sin and my sins rose again to glory that you and I can have eternal life by the transforming power of the Holy Spirit. Man, when you put it like that, when you break it down like that, you know, this is what I meant every time I pray fate arise. I remember growing up of an old hymn, old songs. It says, Because He Lives by Bill and Gloria Gather. You probably don't know this, you know, but the the word of it is so simple. We, we don't get many simple songs again these days, you know. This day, many songs in praise and worship is all about rhythm and, you know, beats and, you know, bridge, uh, interlude and everything. <laughs> but, you know, back then it was a lot simpler. It says, God sent His Son. They call Him Jesus. He came to love, heal, and forgive. He lived and died to buy my pardon. An empty grave is there to prove my Savior lives. And then the chorus is powerful. It says, because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Faith comes by, you know, believing in the good news, the promise of Christ. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds the future. And life is worth the living just because he lives. Sebab dia hidup ada hari esok. 
Sebab dia hidup ku tak gentar. Karena ku tahu dia pegang hari esok. Hidup jadi berarti sebab dia hidup. Because he live. That's our assurance. Not because we can. Not because we're rich. Not because we're smart. Not because we can. But because he lives. Faith comes by believing in the certainty of the promise of God. What happens if your hope is the one that's struggling? When your hope is struggling, we go down one level. You've got to go down and revisit what love means, what love meant. The bottom line is that we can't have a strong hope if we lack the experience of what love is. I mean, you may know what, let's just say for a conversation sake, you may know what Disney World is, but maybe not all of you have been through Disney World. The same thing goes with love, especially the love of God or God's love for you. We all know the concept. We've heard of it being preached. Maybe you've read it somewhere, but the truth is not all of us have experienced, truly experienced the love of God, even those who grew up in church. You know, so this is what I'm talking about. We have got to not cheapen down the concept and the grade of love and water it down by the world's version. Many times it's not even love, it's lust. But we have got to experience, encounter, and that experience, that encounter is reserved for every single one of you, not just for me as a pastor or not just for the leaders. God would want you to encounter himself. He says, come to me. He knows what he's talking about. But many times we're just content to just know him and see him from a distance. We read it from a book. We've heard it from a sermon, but we would not allow ourselves to be vulnerable enough or close enough so that we can encounter him. Come to think of it, that's what the degree of relationship in the mind of every people these days. They just want to have, you know, acquaintance, but they never want to get close. Maybe because they've been hurt in the past. But let me tell you something. Many times when our hope is struggling, it's because, you know, we, we lack the experience of what love is. When you're struggling, you need to re-encounter the power of His love. You know, it's not that you don't read His word, you know, enough. You know, but maybe because love needs to take a deeper work within your heart. Look at this. This is so good. You all know about Lamentation, right? The book of Lamentation says that His grace and mercy are new every, man, every morning. But look at this comparison. This is, it says here, The thought of my pain, my homelessness, is bitter poison. This is, you know, about Israelites lamenting their life problem. And look at this. I think of it constantly, and my spirit is depressed. As I was reading this, I was saying in my heart, God, you're not fair. <laughs> you know me. You know me like the back of your hands. But this is the truth. This is most of us. The thought of my pain, my homelessness is bitter poison. I think of it constantly and my spirit is depressed. Okay, next slide. Praise God for next slide. Help me read this. Yet, hope returns. When what? When I remember this one thing, what is that one thing? The Lord's unfailing love and mercy still continue, fresh as the morning, as sure as the sunrise. Wow, did you see that? You know, I think of my pain constantly and my spirit is distressed. Yet when I begin to remember this one thing, hope returns. Hope returns when I switch what I'm thinking. The Lord's unfailing love and mercy still continue. You see, in the discipline and art of cooking, there's this device called crock pot or slow cooker. Anybody know what I'm talking about? You know, if you're cooking like oxtail or, you know, some, you know, heavy meat, you know, you put it there, stew it, let it simmer, set it on slow cook, leave it overnight. Not only the meat will become tender, it will be very tasty because all the spices gets into the very fiber of the meat. Wow, everybody is... Yeah. But then again, there's another art of cooking 
student dorm style, microwave, instant noodle, right? So this is the problem. Many times we slow cook our worry, but we microwave our hope. That's the truth. So what occupies our mind most of the times are, 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 are oh, my homelessness, like Israel says, my pain, my problem, and we let it marinate, slow cook overnight. Some of you would even lose, lose sleep over it. So what it means, slow cooker. So the next time you cannot sleep because of something, a problem, a fear, a challenge, remember what I'm saying. Crockpot's on. Switch it off, put it in a microwave. Lord, I'm worried about this, but I'm going to surrender it to you. But switch the strategy. Instead, marinate on God's word. Marinate on his promise. Read his word. Okay, I've read it. Read it again. I've read it. Okay, read it again. You know, I'm surprised many times when we begin the service. Maybe it's because I'm old school. But I notice that most of the time when we start a service and I say, okay, let's read. All of you would be like a deer hit in the, free, in the, in the middle of free or hit by a headlight. You're just like, I want you to read the word of God. I want you to read the Bible. And in case you don't bring a Bible, there's this app called YouVersion. You need to read it. Faith comes by hearing, by reading also. Read the word of God. We're getting lazy these days. We thought we just bring ourselves to church. We don't sing. Let the people here do the singing for us. God would know. And my heart will suddenly be okay. The Bible says, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. I could just, if that's the case, I mean, if you think that just by being here with no effort, you know, is enough to fellowship and encounter Him, I would just play a tape and let you all go home. You know. But let everything that has breath praise the Lord. How would you have a strong faith if your hope is in disarray? If you can, you've never even experienced the touch of God. You've never experienced the love of God. And yet we are living on the day of days and the last days. And your faith, hope, and love is in disarray. Come on, church. My job here is not to preach to you what's popular. I'm, my job is not to make the Bible acceptable. I'm, my job is just to make it available. But it's on you if you're not going to take it. Why don't we change? Hey, you know what? There's a great idea. This is 2022. Let's change. Let's change. Many times we ask God to change for us. But what, what do you say you and I change this year? You know, let's slow cook God's promises and let's microwave our problem for a change. Because most of the time, look at this. I'm not the one talking. This is the, Go back to the previous slide so that we, we read this again. The thought of my pain, my homelessness, homelessness is bitter poison. I think of it constantly. You frame it, you post it, you pin it, and as a result, your spirit is depressed. But thank God, the word of God says that, yet hope returns when I remember this one thing, the Lord's unfailing love and mercy. When your hope is struggling, you need to revisit what it means is the power of His love. You need to revisit that experience again and again. Amen? So we need the con to continuous, we, we need, what we need is a continuous experience of the power of His love. And listen to this. We should never graduate from learning the power of His love. Why, why do I say this? Because many times we, we, we have this mentality, oh, I know that. Oh, I've heard that. Oh, I've, I've, yeah, I've experienced this before. And you know what? Before long, you become prideful. Because every time God wants to speak to you through this verse, or through a verse that you are so familiar with, you dismiss it. The word may be the same, but the spirit is always new every morning. It's always new. It's always different. It's always different. All right? So I want to encourage you. Open your heart. So I want to share with you some points about experiencing the power of his love that I think is 
very important and critical. So the first thing I want to share is that we need to experience God loving us as a father. We need to experience God loving us as a father. So these three things remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of this is love. We need to always revisit, relive, and counter the power of his love. What, it, what about? First thing is that we need to experience God loving us as a father. The greatest revelation in our faith and in any faith ever is that God as a father. You can go search any other belief and religion. The thought that God would manifest himself as a father is... But Romans chapter 8 and Jesus' admission himself that God chose. I mean, he could be the almighty one, the ruler of the whole universe, creator of everything in the universe. And every single bit of it is true. But instead of all the title, of all the salutation that is true about God, what he did, what he endeared the most, what he loved the most when it comes to him and you, is that he is your father. And here's where the problem is, because many times, how we value and view, sentimentalize the word father would fall back on our experience with our earthly father. Because we're still human beings. But I want to encourage you this morning to have a biblical understanding what it means. Paul in Romans says that the Holy Spirit, you know what the Holy Spirit is? The Holy Spirit is the spirit of adoption. Because of the Holy Spirit that within us, we become His children. So Luke chapter 15, verse 17 to 24, another powerful, powerful word from Jesus himself about the story of the prodigal son. Actually, Jesus was trying to reveal to you the nature of the father. The nature of the father. And maybe you've experienced love from so many different things. But what is so critical, so important for every single believer who dares to call themselves followers of Christ is that you need to encounter, you need to experience, you need to see Him as a Father. And you need to encounter Him, loving you as a Father. And you know, the best picture ever is found in Luke chapter 15, verse 17 to 24, about the story of the prodigal son. You know, it's so powerful, there you can see that the Father would love you relentlessly. He would not give up on you. You know, when you want to know about love keeps no records of wrong, hello, you read this. You read this. Because right there, right then, when the son was ready to go back with the admission of his sin, the father would not even entertain his confession. The father did not even reply to the son's admission about his wrong. Instead, the father turned to the servant. Restore him. Put the best of the best in him. Get celebration lineup. All he cares is that my son was once lost, now he is found. That is the love of a father. You know. And it was says that when the son was still a distance away, the father has already seen him. And take note, it was the father who took the first approach of running to him and embracing him. Come on, church. I mean, you've known God as a deity. You've known God from the pages of history. You've known God from the pages of philosophy, you know, religious book and everything. You've known Him from a distance if you have not encountered Him as a father. And this is why some of us, this is why most of us, and I've had myself in that position where I thought I have faith, but actually what I have is religious conviction. But faith does not take place until you encounter Him truly as a Father embracing you. You know, embracing you. Man, come on. You need to experience the power of His love as a Father in your life. And right here, right now, you know, he's stretching out his arm. He's, he's so eager. You know, many times our song is only one-sided because our song would convey, Lord, I love you. I long for you. 
It's like you're saying, Lord, I miss you. You know what? He is the one who has been missing us longer than we have. <laughs> He's the one. We are on his mind all the time. The next thing, you know, we need to experience receiving God's nurture. While, you know, some of you are macho men who knows nothing about nurture. <laughs> You know, some men who are macho, you know, don't want to have any tenderness as close as them to be identified on them. But the truth is that as a human being, we need nurture. We do need nurture. I don't care how strong and macho of a man you are or macho of a woman you are. <laughs> you need nurture. And you need to understand that this is one of the characteristic and job description of the Holy Spirit. This is what the Holy Spirit is. The Holy Spirit's job He's the spirit of comforter. It is to nurture us. It is to help keep you in peace and to remind you of truth with the comfort and nurture of God. That's the job of the Holy Spirit. I don't know if you notice, but every time we end the service, I always put in this word as our blessing, as our benediction. Romans 15, verse 13. It says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace, as you trust in Him. That's the key there. As you trust in Him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. So, in my understanding, the way I read this is that, you know, allow God to fill you as you surrender to Him. Allow God to fill you with hope as you allow Him to nurture you as you continue to trust in Him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of Holy Spirit. These days, people are overflowing with hate. People are overflowing with fear. People are overflowing with envy. People are overflowing with bitterness. But we need to be overflowing with hope. And the only way we can do that is not with, you know, trying to just adjust our habit or mental attitude. No, we got to experience change from within. We got to experience transformation from within. And the only one who can do that is the Holy Spirit. And it can only happen as you continue to trust in Him, as you surrender to Him, as you open yourself to Him. You need to sit down. You need to slow down. You need to... Bear down. You need to be vulnerable. You know, I remember the illustration, the, the story about Jesus in the house of Mary and Martha. The truth is the kingdom of God has too many Martha. It's not that work is not important, but many times work takes priority over slowing down and listening to God and allowing Him to minister to you. What Jesus did to Mary, actually, Jesus is filling her up. Jesus is actually ministering to her. Jesus is nurturing her. And if you believe in the power of the Holy Spirit, you should believe in the power of His nurture because that's what the Holy Spirit is all about. He's the spirit of comforter. And His job is to nurture you. When you are running with 700 miles per hour approach in life and never takes time to slow down and allow the Spirit to heal you from all your wounds and nurture you, fill you, even our car is scheduled for a maintenance to be revealed of all fluids. Hello? That's car. Are we stronger than our car? You need the continuous nurture from the Holy Spirit. That's His job. Allow Him to do His job. The Father would want to manifest His love to you if you would trust Him. If you would allow him to do his inner working within you. Last thing. I need to learn to love myself the same way that God loved me. Okay. Before you are too quick at dismissing this. This is very important. Matthew 22, 36, 39. The question was what's the, the most important law in the book, right? That one thing that is the most important. Jesus says what? Love the Lord your God with all of your heart. Right? 
And then he says, that's the supreme command, but the other one that's equal, what do you say? Second one is like it in importance. He says, you must love your friend in the same way you love yourself. Other translation says, love others as well as you love yourself. Whoa, you have to love yourself well. And I'm not talking about narcissistic, you know, uh, 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 what do you call, selfish, you know, self-pleasing, self-gratification kind of love. No, 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 no. You need to treasure yourself the same way he treasured you. For God so loved the world. The world is you, actually. You can re- replace that word love, w- world, with your name. For God so loved Z that he gave his only begotten son. You know, because the truth is many times we're too hard on ourselves. We're too hard on ourselves. I know there are another extreme of people who think only about themselves and not others. But I find that in the church, in Christianity, especially on a more mature Christian, those who have been in the faith for a longer time, there are more Martha than Mary when it comes to this. And what I meant is that we oftentimes are very hard on ourselves. You know, if we're not careful, that can lead to pride. If we're not careful, that can lead, you know, to us being hard on other people. First, we are hard on ourselves, and then we're going to be hard on other people. You need to learn to see yourself according to the eyes of a merciful father. You need to learn to love yourself the same way He loves you. A loving father does not spoil the children. So I'm not talking, if, in case you think, oh, okay, see, you're right, Pastor, so I think I need to buy that clothes or buy that car or buy, you know. I need to love myself. You know that's not what I'm talking about. But there are deeper issues that we need to align ourselves with how He loves us. Because without this, you cannot love others. Same way that you love them. Simple. How does God love us? If we go back to 1 Corinthians 13, that's His characteristic, right? That's the characteristic of God. Just simple. Love is patient and kind. And then everything else is actually under that umbrella. Love is patient and kind. You need to be patient to yourself. Allow the Holy Spirit to do His inner working and deeper working within your heart. And many times what fuel our impatience toward others is when we look at social media and look at other people's life. You know, we are looking at their lobster breakfast and we're looking at our microwave macaroni and cheese here (laughs) and we're thinking man how do things move faster Lord (laughs) what you don't know is that it's also a screen saver for them (laughs) or they probably have a lot of debt to pay from their credit card because of that sorry lobster breakfast well what you have is full fully paid and clear Love is patient. Love is kind. Be kind to yourself. Be kind to yourself. You cannot be kind to others if you don't know the concept of being kind to yourself. Love others as well as you love yourself. That's balance. That's balance. The two things must happen at the same time. Amen, church? So I want to encourage you. These three things remain. These are the three virtues of the Christianity, of the church. This should be the culture of the church. This should be the very founding, the building block of who you are as a believer in Christ. Faith, hope, and love. The greatest of this is love. God is love. That's His characteristic. And we are called the people of love. And I want to encourage you this morning. Come on, church. Let's be serious in our faith. Let's be serious about rebuilding our faith. 
Let's be serious about strengthening again the pillars and the virtues of what we believe. Why you do what you do and why you believe what you believe. Because if you don't know what you stand for, you know, you will fall for anything. So this is my prayer. Again, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 18. And may you have the power to understand, as all God's people should. All God's people should, not just the pastors or the ministers. As all God people should. How wide, how long, how high, and how deep His love is and His love for you. Amen? So today, make room for this truth in your life. You know, I hope we really mean what we said when we sing that song, you know, shake up the ground of all my tradition. Because his way is better than our ways. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you this morning for your word. I pray, Lord, this morning that your church will go back to the sovereignty, to the supremacy of your word. And I pray this morning that we will make room for you. We will make room for your belief. We will make room for your truth. Deliver us from our negative self. But help us, O oh God, to go back to our Christian identity, to our identity through Christ Jesus. I pray this morning that your people will experience such a profound and genuine love for you, for your word. Again, Lord, because we know that faith comes from hearing the good news about Christ. Faith in God means believing and trusting in the greatest hope that God became man, lived a perfect life, died a sacrifice death for our sins, rose again to glory so that we could have eternal life by the transforming power of the Holy Spirit. Lord, touch us. Deliver us from the thought of our pain and our homelessness and our problem, oh God, that becomes bitter poison to our soul and spirit. Help us not to think of it constantly that we get depressed. But instead, let hope return because of remembering, because of us remembering this one thing. That the Lord's unfailing love and mercy still continue. Fresh as the morning, sure as the sunrise. So the Lord's unfailing love and mercy is three things. It is continuous, it is fresh, and it is sure. It is guaranteed. So Lord, I pray this morning that faith will arise in the hope that is founded in your love over us. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Touch us again, Lord. Help us, O oh Lord, to experience, encounter you as our Father. Help us, O oh God, to surrender, to allow you to nurture us. Help us this morning, O oh God. Help us, O oh Lord Jesus. That we may love ourselves the same way you love us, O oh God. I will make room for you to do whatever you want to, to do whatever you want to. I will make room for you to do whatever you want to, to do whatever you want to. Come on, let's sing it one more time. I will make room for you to do whatever you want to, to do whatever you want. I will make room for you, Lord.
Thank you, Lord. We surrender to you, Lord. Let your kingdom come, your will be done in our life, in our heart, as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. All right.